Coming up, America's changing foreign policy. I think it's hard. I think we have made some progress. I don't think we are going to be able to stop all atrocities. Georgetown law professor Rosa Brooks discusses her ethical upbringing, post-conflict reconstruction, and Obama's struggles. It's just ahead on Global Ethics Forum. Good evening. I'm James Traub, and welcome to the Carnegie Council's Ethics Matter series. Our guest tonight is the law scholar, foreign policy pundit, public servant, Rosa Brooks. So from 2009 to 2011, Rosa was counselor to the Under Secretary of Defense, uh, where she also had a special focus on the rule of law and humanitarian policy. Uh, Rosa now teaches at Georgetown Law School, and she's a colleague of mine at Foreign Policy. So Rosa, thank you so much for being here tonight. It's good to be here, Jim. So I want to ask you a little bit just about your background. So your mother is the famous Barbara Ehrenreich, who was a great crusader for justice, a famous writer. I now know from her recent memoir, a kind of ruthless rationalist. So did that predispose you towards the kinds of human rights and humanitarian issues that have now been a focus of your career? Probably, yes. Uh, my mother is a writer and a social activist. My stepfather is a union organizer. My mother and father met uh, as anti-war activists in the 1960s, so a little bit odd that I ended up working at the Pentagon and marrying a military officer, but... Um, Was that an act of rebellion on your part? <laughs> I don't think so. Um, but my mother came to uh, my farewell ceremony when I left the Pentagon, and it was actually very, very sweet. And I, I, I said during the ceremony, the same thing I'll say to you, which is that my mother certainly taught me that uh, it was always important to, to be trying to make the world a little bit better, because that's what you had to do. So I think that, that that ethos certainly permeated our household, that that's what it was about. You were not put here on Earth in order to get rich or be happy. You were put here on earth to make the world better. And that it is a little bit ruthless at times, um, but, but it certainly was very powerful. And so did you go to law school thinking you would do this kind of stuff, or did you just go to law school because if you don't know what to do with yourself, you go to law school? I went to law school because if you don't know what to do with yourself, yeah. you go to law school. Yeah. And a lot of my friends were going to law school. Yeah. And I drifted into human rights by accident. I thought I would work on domestic social policy issues or maybe be a public defender. Uh, I, d I didn't go in thinking that I was going to work on international issues at all. And did you, was the public service thing part of what were you had pre Definitely. previously intended? Yeah, you wanted to go into government. Yeah, when I was an undergraduate, I was uh, very involved in our undergraduate community service organization, and that was, that was my thing when I was an undergraduate. I more or less lived at the public service. Phillips Brooks House. Phillips Brooks House, yeah. yes. Uh, and when I was at in law Harvard, school. in case we haven't made that clear, okay, <laughs> just yes. Uh, that's yeah, that was that was my thing when I was in college, and and then when I was in law school, I, I took a lot of different clinics, community legal services clinic, poverty legal services clinic, landlord tenant clinic. So I thought that's the kind of work I was going to do, uh, and then I I had a South African boyfriend at the time, and I really wanted to go spend the summer in South Africa. Because at that point, we were pretty serious. We were talking about maybe living together, getting married. And, but he really wanted to stay in South Africa. And, and I sort of thought, oh, I don't know if I could do that. But I wanted to go see what it was like. And so I, I, it was very expensive to go to South Africa. The, the flight was much more than I could afford at that time in my impoverished student life. And I looked around, and I, I, I thought, hmm, maybe there's some source of funding here at the law school for this. And sure enough, there was a human rights summer fellowship you could apply for. And I thought, well, human rights, they've got some human rights issues in South Africa. This was in Wow, this is 19, deep, deep moral commitment on your part. Huh? <laughs> 1993 or 94. Yeah. Uh, so I applied with a fairly you know, trumped up proposal, and, and I got some money. And I went off to South Africa for the summer, and I worked on prisoners' rights issues and uh, domestic violence issues and um, broke up with a boyfriend, uh, but sort of fell in love with human rights work. So Harold Coe was one of our guests a few months ago, and Rosa uh, worked with him at Yale, and then you worked with him at, at the Clinton administration. And so what were the issues that you were working with during that Clinton period? Uh, a lot of work on Kosovo. That was the big issue at the time, and on the Sierra Leonean Civil War. And, and Harold, uh, at that time, he was the Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, which was not a legal position. It was a policy position. But of course, as a law professor, Harold felt that he was a better lawyer than the people who did have the legal jobs at the State Department. So he hired a bunch of 
law students of his, myself among them, and, and our job was essentially to run around and fight with the people who were supposed to be doing the legal work from state. They hated, they hated us, they just hated us. Um, but we, I, we, I thought well, we were able to make a difference. We did a big project on reforming Kosovo's uh, post-conflict judicial system. We really helped uh, create what became the special court for Sierra Leone to try uh, war crimes, other atrocities that occurred during the Civil War. There were very brutal Civil War, you know, people's limbs being chopped off, that kind of horrible stuff. Uh, so it, 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 it got me out there um, uh, in a way that was sometimes, sometimes exciting, sometimes terrifying. Let me ask you first about this mm -hmm. post-conflict stuff, because it seems to me we're in a phase now where people have almost completely lost faith in this thing that is called post-conflict reconstruction. What's your sense of the extent to which this thing is necessary to do, can be done? Is America naive about this, or what? Um, all of the above. <laughs> uh, I think it's often necessary. Um, more can be done than the skeptics think, less can be done than the, the idealists, both on the neocon side and on the liberal side think. Um, uh, and America is completely naive about it. I've certainly come to the view that we have to be very humble about it and that, frankly, whether we're talking about um, rebuilding rule of law institutions or governance institutions uh, or almost anything that probably the right approach to take is to say to yourself, Let's imagine that whatever it is that I do here, that the funding will run out in one year, and that the political will will run out in one year, and that any foreigners involved in this will be recalled back home or go back home in one year. Uh, what, if anything, could we do that would still have left behind, do, well, do more good real, than harm? That's a tough bar to cross. Well, I, actually, I don't, I don't think it is, okay. because I, I think it pushes you in the direction of thinking smaller, and it pushes you in the direction of really focusing on the fact that you won't be there to see it through, that it's going to be the people who live there who will have to see it through. I think if we reformulate our thinking that way, actually, th there are things that can make a big difference, not in the sort of sweeping, dramatic way mm -hmm. You've worked in many, uh, uh, both developing countries and in post-conflict situations. And, and although I certainly, I think it's right to have a, a healthy skepticism about the, the grandiosity of many of our claims, um, I also think that we very often encounter situations where you, know, you, you talk to local community groups and they say, we're really suffering here and we have an idea. And if we could get this one thing we think would make a difference and they're right, and a, a little can, in fact, go a long way. In addition to the work at the State Department, right in that same period, I, I was, worked for Human Rights Watch for a while. I worked for giving out other people's money, particularly giving out George Soros's money for a while for the Open Society Foundation. And one of my favorite programs I worked with of all time, this was right after the State Department job, um, um, I convinced the, uh, uh, George Soros and other folks at his foundation that in Sierra Leone we should give out micro grants, mm -hmm. by which I meant grants of $25, 50 bucks. Uh, and I, was, I felt like one of those CIA agents, I, you know, like the suitcase, walking around <laughs> yeah. money. Yeah. Because they, we were working with community groups that were so tiny they didn't have bank accounts often. We had to help them figure out how to open a bank account. They could not absorb the fifty, hundred thousand dollar $100,000 grants that most of the big international foundations wanted to give, but they were often the tiny little groups that were actually quite well placed. With, you know, $50 could go a pretty long way in war-torn Sierra Leone in 2000, 2001. So some of these little tiny, that literally were just to do things like clean up the street, mm -hmm. you know, make the toilet work kind of stuff that, yeah, it's small, but on the other hand, the difference in people's day-to-day -day lives of 25 or 50 bucks, the right moment in the right place, was pretty significant. And that was, that was actually a lot of fun and very, yeah. very gratifying. So you wrote a piece in, on the cover of, I guess, the previous issue of foreign policy about how the military is configuring itself in this new world. And so uh, that piece was about what's called regionally aligned forces, which is this new idea that the military has. And you were sort of jokingly saying it's a totally confused idea, and that's probably a good thing because that way it satisfies lots of different bureaucratic uh, constituents and everybody can make believe it's what they think. And so I couldn't tell from reading it if you actually thought that or you were basically saying this is the irony of a, of a badly planned out policy whose only virtue is that it lets everybody imagine that it is what they think it is. I, a little bit of both. Yeah. Um, I, so this is, this is really talking about the army and, yeah. and the army in particular is at a moment now when it's kind of going, gosh, what do we do? What's the United States Army for? 
and it comes out of the same moment, right? That we, Iraq war's over, draw down in Afghanistan, uh, the pendulum is swung to a moment where everybody's saying, we're not, I'm never gonna do that again, so what do we need all these soldiers for? Because you know, we're not gonna have any more of those wars. We're gonna we're gonna have drone strikes, right? We're gonna we're gonna have cyber. We're gonna have these high tech. Well, and also things. the pivot to Asia means navy and air we're force. Gonna pivot, we're gonna pivot. Right? We're gonna do coastal, high tech, coastal navy, things. air force yeah. stuff. And so we don't need all these guys with you know money boots and big rucksacks anymore. And the army, of course, is kind of going, oh wait, wait, wait. Yes, you do still need us. And and the whole regionally aligned forces concept for the army is a is is in part a way uh, to say you do still need us, folks. Um, and the 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 concept is essentially. Look, you can have all these fancy high tech things that you want. A, a theoretical level, I think, is completely right. This, you can all these high tech things you want, but if you don't understand what's going on all around the world, it will get you nowhere. You need to have, you know, human relationships. You need to know people. You know, and to, if you want to get to know people, you have to have human beings on the ground talking to other human beings, and you can't do that from the cockpit of a simulated cockpit of a drone. You have to be out there, and only the army does that. Where the guys who kind of stomp around on the ground. And so we're going to have this initiative, the regionally aligned forces concept. We're going to have greater emphasis and training on cultural knowledge, linguistic knowledge, and we're going to be focusing on building relationships. And, and you know, in theory, yeah, it's a great idea, right? Uh, the trouble is, of course, um, there is a uh, not a total, but a very substantial mismatch between the goals and the nature of the army, which still consists very largely of you know 18 to 26 year old males. Not a demographic famed for its, you know, intercultural savvy <laughs> and sophistication and good judgment. Um, and the army, like all the military services, is a is a slow moving bureaucracy which has a really, really, really hard time changing. It's the proverbial aircraft carrier; it doesn't turn fast. And so the the focus of the article is that I, I think, good idea in theory, in practice, somewhere between tiny bit better and kind of a mess. Um, but that being said, you know, as, as you noted, there, there's a sense in which it's, uh, it's being sold in every possible way to multiple different audiences. You know, if, you, if, you, if you're a sort of neocon or a liberal interventionist, you say, look, we're going to be everywhere. We're going to have our tentacles all over the place. Isn't that great? If you're an isolationist, it's being sold as, don't worry, we're going to be focusing on building relationships and training other people's military so we don't have to fight wars anymore. Isn't that great? And they go, well, that's great. You know, and so, <laughs> so there are all sorts of ways in which this is kind of being packaged. The same, not very substantial thing is being packaged uh, in a way to make it appealing to everyone, although it remains to be seen. Even that may not be enough at this moment of uh, budget cutting to kind of save, save the army. There is, by the way, an incredibly funny but also pitiful moment in your article where so Rosa is talking to the public affairs officer at a base in Kuwait and says she wants to go out and meet Kuwaitis. And the woman is perplexed. Why, why, what do you want to meet Kuwaitis for? And then later, you're at a reception given by Kuwaitis. And, sh and they have local cuisine. And the woman says, I don't like cultural food. A cultural yeah. food, it just made your heart break. You know, it just, it was so, but you think, how can this country, which we are, that is on a continent, actually successfully apply itself yeah. to places 10,000 miles away of which we know nothing? Well, and the thing that always kind of blows my mind, right, is that this is one of the incredibly diverse country, right? We have in our own population, we people speak so many languages, you know, so much cultural knowledge from other places, you know, relatives, friends in other countries. And we do such a bad job at sort of tapping that sort of collective intelligence and sophistication in any coherent way. We are so smart in some ways at connecting with other people all over the world and so dumb in other ways that it's just mind-blowing. I want to ask you a little bit about the Obama administration. There's now this growing sense, it's, it's becoming almost consensual, that Obama turns out to be irresolute, he doesn't have a, over, an, an overarching sense of purpose, he's too naive, and in the end he's been an ineffective foreign policy president. So mm -hmm. what's your Judgment. I don't think he's irresolute, um, and I don't think he's naive. 
Uh, but I don't think he's very interested in foreign policy either, and I don't think there's an overarching theory in particular. Um, uh, I think he's a very smart guy. I think that he, he really just isn't that interested. And so he, day to day, delegated a lot of it to staff who weren't so great. Um, a lot of dumb decisions got made or decisions that should have been made didn't get made. And what then, would be, from your point of view, the headline dumb decisions? Oh, golly. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I think I, th I do think that the Afghanistan either you know do it or don't do it. But the let's sort of do it in a way that we know won't work because we know we're doing it halfway. I think that was that was up there. Uh, I think that uh, missing what short window there was to do something useful in Syria uh, was probably also up there. Um, so now you but, would say it, there's almost no good policy. I sure don't know one. Yeah. Um, I sure don't know one. Um, but as he said in his speech at West Point, uh, he's, you know, I've ended two wars, or I've ended one, I'm about to end the other. Um, the, and, he, and he warned, he, you know, he gives great speeches, he warned against an over-reliance on, on military power, and that's quite right. But what he, what he didn't talk about very much was uh, we have a third war, which is a largely covert war via largely drones with a little bit of special operations raids thrown in there for good measure. Uh, which I think we are absolutely over relying on to our detriment. I think it's I think it's uh, strategically it's self destructive, and as a human rights and rule of law person, I think it's quite shocking uh, that the Obama administration um, is in effect uh, saying, "Hey, we can we can kill anybody anywhere for reasons that we won't make public." You had that conversation with your former boss, Harold Cohen. I, I, I have. We we disagree about this. Um, I, and Harold, I think, absolutely feels there needs to be more transparency um, and more accountability. But but I, but we we somewhat disagree on this. But no, I I think that I think that that too, in a way, is a reflection of the president. He's just he's not really a foreign policy guy, you know. When and this was, is kind of the easy yeah. opportunistic way to. But when he was it. first, when he was running in mm -hmm. two thousand seven, he always talked about putting a new face on America in terms of how the world sees the United States, that he was going to go to the Middle East, as he did, mm -hmm. and show that America was different. He would, had visionary goals yeah. on nonproliferation, on climate change, on energy, on making the international architecture, all that stuff. So it seems surprising that he is as indifferent to the world, or as, as little interested in the world as you're describing. I think the other piece of it, though, is 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 you know, something that he didn't fully appreciate. He may appreciate it more now. I, I didn't fully appreciate. I think a lot of people didn't fully appreciate. Um, Hillary Clinton is somewhere, sitting there somewhere saying, I told you so. Um, but he had an inexperienced crew. Uh, and his the people he brought in, his inner circle on foreign policy, certainly early on, were uh, largely folks from his campaign and from the Hill. Uh, and the executive branch of the United States government is this unbelievably, as you know, is this hugely complicated beast, which uh, takes a long time to even begin to understand. And I certainly feel like after however many years in and out of the government, I'm still only beginning to understand how it works, how it doesn't work, what, the, the, what are the sort of the levers that make things happen. And I think part of it was just that, that his, he had a young, inexperienced staff. Uh, they didn't understand that announcing a policy doesn't mean anything changes, that you have to have you know, a real plan right. for working with this very sluggish bureaucracy to, to implement it. And, and so the you know, classic example of this, after the president's Cairo speech, I think you were referring to that a moment ago, he gives a speech, he says, to transform our relationship with, with the uh, Middle East and Arab and Islamic worlds, and we're going to have you know, entrepreneurship and cultural exchanges and health and science exchanges. It's going to be great. And um, everybody said, yay, what a great speech. This is so transformative. We're so excited. And calls started coming in to the White House. You know, people saying, both foreigners and Americans, corporate folks, you know, NGOs, saying, how can we help? We want to help. Hi, hi I'm a, I'm a, I run a dot com. I've got a ton of money. How do, how do I help? You know, or hi, we're the government of such and such. We want to help. What can we do? And the White House staff, which the, the staff for that effort consisted of about three people, mm. all under the age of 30. Um, and they did a sort of collective, we'll get back to you. You know, and, and 
so part of it's just that. I have to say mea culpa here. I, I was a columnist for the Los Angeles Times from 2005 to 2009, and I was a, I was a fierce uh, Obama partisan. Me too. And I, I was saying, you know, the people who say he's inexperienced, it doesn't matter, he's so smart, he's so great. And I regret it. I, I think I, I, I too radically underestimated the importance of, uh, you know, boring experience. Going back to the earlier part about conflict resolution and human rights, how do you feel um, America can deal with genocide, as in Rwanda, as in Cambodia, as in so many other places? and really encourage the rule of law. This is actually an area where, despite not being particularly thrilled with what's happened in Syria, I, I actually think the administration has made some real progress. And I give Samantha Power some credit for that. I, I give actually our Office of the Pentagon some credit for that. That the internal mechanism for sort of early warning has improved dramatically. Um, that part of it is just that, part of it is developing, a, and this goes back to the point about Hillary Clinton versus Obama, sort of the importance of structure and process. You know, you can say, we will stop genocide, but if you don't have any internal process to even flag the signs, the early warning signs, um, it's gonna be really hard to do. And I think in some, in, in some ways that are really hard to see to the general public, the administration has made some real progress on better, early warning mechanisms and better funding of things like uh, media intervention and funding for local NGOs that work on media issues very, very early on to get, to get information out to people. So Rosa, where has, where has the administration acted, would you say? Can you think of specific cases where they've done something in, in terms of preventive action? Yeah, no, I, I, th I, think, I think it's dozens of places, actually. And, and that's why I, I think it's really hard to see. And the nature of this stuff, right, of the genocide, it's the dog that doesn't bark in the night, right? It's, it's the, the genocides that don't happen, we don't ever know about because they don't happen. And the stuff that we do is so under the radar that you, you know, how do you, how do you know it's the thing that stopped the genocide? Well, you don't, of course. But I think, I think, I mean, I mentioned media, and I think that that's, that's an area where, just to take that as an example, one of the things that we've seen across a lot of different cultures, uh, whether it's Rwanda, uh, Bosnia, or going back to the Holocaust, uh, is the rise of hate media, as an er both as an early warning sign of impending atrocities, but also as a mechanism uh, literally to mobilize people to get them out there to say, here's who you should go kill. And so, for instance, a real targeted program to monitor hate media and to, to respond by both by funding alternative narratives and, and by trying to discourage that from happening directly uh, is one of the sort of very tiny little things that has been done that actually does, I think, make a difference. This is something that Samantha Power constantly right, says, and she's, she's not wrong. Uh, she sort of says everybody thinks that stopping genocide should be sending in the Marines. Um, we never want to get to that moment where that's the choice, where, where we're like in Syria, where it seems like, gosh, the choice is do you invade, do you do nothing? If we've gotten there, we've already failed, that you want to be in that place where, where your, your ability to make a difference, you, you got to it early enough that it is invisible. So I think it's hard. I think we have made some progress. Uh, I don't think we are going to be able to stop all atrocities. We probably shouldn't try because sometimes we make things worse and that's the, you know, the old uh, uh, you know, just war theory says, uh, essentially like the Hippocratic Oath, you know, first do no harm. It's easy to look at something and say, we ought to do something, but if you're not quite confident that you can do more good than harm, well, maybe you shouldn't do something. Could you comment on uh, how you regard the balance that would be ideal between State Department diplomacy and uh, Pentagon force? I'm actually gonna differ, I think, probably from where you would come out on this, Jim, and where, where a lot of my uh, friends come out on this. You know, God did not invent the State Department, God did not invent the military, right? These are categories we created. And the distinctions between these institutions and their roles, you know, are totally arbitrary. Um, I, so, and I think that we've sort of started to fetishize the idea of that once upon a time in the good old days, we had these wonderful civilian institutions, and oh my gosh, this is so sad, they've been defunded, and look, the military's doing all these things it shouldn't, has no business doing. And we must just go back to the way it used to be. 
which, which I don't think is going to happen in, in any of our political lifetimes. Um, I see zero likelihood on the Hill that anybody is going to start refunding the civilian side here. There's a glass half full and a glass half empty way to think of this. And the glass half empty way to think of it is to say, oh my gosh, we've seen the militarization of American foreign policy. And that is an accurate statement. But I think it's equally accurate to say, the glass half full version, that we are seeing the civilianization of the American military. And there's probably no going back. Uh, so I am more inclined to focus on the military for all its flaws has the ability to kind of marshal human talent and ingenuity to a vastly greater degree than any other public institution we currently have. So can we build on that somehow and make it smarter and better and more subtle, which it's not so great at right now, right? Um, CF, cultural food. Um, can we build on that instead? And to the extent that we have concerns about civilian control of the military, which we should have, uh, you know, I think that at root that those are concerns about accountability and about restraint on power. But it seems to me that there are other mechanisms than a particular, any particular set of institutional arrangements. There are other mechanisms we could come up to achieve those same goals with a different set of structures. So Rosa, thank you so much. This has just been great. And, uh... For more on this program and other Carnegie Ethics Studio productions, visit carnegiecouncil.org. There you can find video highlights, transcripts, audio recordings, and other multimedia resources on global ethics. This program is made possible by the Carnegie Ethics Studio and viewers like you.